Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are back with another Neurodiversity Stories, and I'm your host. My name is Darren Clark, and I created Neurodiversity Stories to spread more awareness around neurodiversity. So we have had phenomenal guests every single week, all sharing their experiences around neurodiversity and also just kind of giving their, their thoughts on, um, on, on how things are changing and maybe their experiences in the past. And it's just been incredible. And today we have yet another phenomenal uh, chap, uh, Matthew Head. He's a senior vehicle design and engineer and founder of Dyslexia uh, Hacks. Incredible, incredible individual. Uh, and I know you guys are going to absolutely love him. Um, and I really, really do appreciate him giving up uh, his time and his busy schedule to to come on to uh, neurodiversity stories. So, guys, uh, as I said before, what you know. I do this purely uh, to try and spread more awareness around uh, neurodiversity, and I really do appreciate everyone's uh, support on this. Uh, people tuning in from all different uh, parts of the world. So if you uh, are tuning in, please let us know where you're tuning in from, maybe what country you're tuning in from. I know we go as far as kind of Australia, uh, Kenya, Argentina, and Africa, and, and things like that. So please feel free to uh, to pop in uh, the chats underneath if uh where you are and where you're from. So guys, I also want to say a massive thank you to our sponsors, Clara Software, and I want to show you guys this. guys, Clara Software uh, develops assistive technology software for people with disabilities such as print and re uh, for reading and difficulties like dyslexia to keep them achieving all they can. Incredible, incredible organization. Please do. All the details will be uh, in the links uh, in there. So please do uh, check them out. Again, guys, if you could just let us know where you're tuning in from, that would be fantastic. And now I bring on my my next guest. Well, my my first guest, my only guest for today um, is Matthew Head. So as I mentioned before, he's a, a senior vehicle design engineer and founder of Dyslexia Hacks. Uh, he's going to be sharing his uh, his story around his dyslexic uh, journey um, and some of the kind of twists and turns that he's done. And it's phenomenal, uh, phenomenal journey, journey he's, he's been on, um, how he's you know gone from a mechanic and now uh, an engineer uh, working on some, some incredible projects. So, guys, um, I want to give a, a warm, warm welcome to... Uh, to my uh, good friend, Matthew Head. Good morning, Matthew. How are you this morning? I'm not too bad. How are you? Yeah, very well, very well, sir. Very well indeed. Thank you so much indeed for uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to to come on to uh, Neurodiversity Stories. Um, no problem at all, Matthew. I know uh, I, I've obviously been uh, following you on uh, social media, on on LinkedIn, seeing the stuff, the incredible stuff that you're doing uh, for the neurodiversity community, and also you know the the incredible journey that you've you, you've been on. It'd be amazing if you could just uh, let the let the people who are watching kind of a little bit about, about you and uh, kind of uh you know who you are and what you do that'd be amazing yes okay um so <laughs> start at the beginning so <laughs> um i got picked up on stamity with dyslexia at about six years old i apparently and my mum has to fill me in on the early stuff but uh <laughs> i had a bit of a sort of lesson understanding teacher in my first year of school uh, and then when i moved into my second year the teacher i had sort of did a lot of reading up around the subject and thought that maybe i was dyslexic so she sent me through to be statemented, which I did at about six. I did various, done various things along school time, including going, I have vague memories of going to like uh, extra help sessions where we had to do a load of stuff for dyspraxia being pushed around. I've never be, done this being statemented with dyspraxia, but I remember going off on this sort of trial thing when I was in secondary school, which I swear were cod liver oil tablets, but I think there was a <laughs> whether they could do medication as well. So you know, as an adult, when you get creaky dreadful knees, you know, like, these are the same tablets. <laughs> dreadful taste, dreadful taste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, so all the way through school and secondary school, I'd always have the sort of, because um, you got statemented 
quite late on in life, didn't you? In your 30s, yeah, if I remember. 30, yeah. 36, 36, 37. Yes. Oh, very, right. It's so about the same age I am now. Um, Thanks and it's that. really interesting to. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> It'd be interesting to get into that, how it's different. I've never had the light bulb moment and going, oh, that's what it is. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's all I all I know. So yeah. I kind of went through school, had all the extra lessons in school. I remember them sort of arguing with me whether I should drop a GCSE to get an hour extra help a week. But the only one they'd let me drop is one of my strongest subjects. So mm -hmm. I kept it and sort of battered on through. Then got into college. And by the time I'd finished college, I was kind of done with education. My brain had melted. Um, I... Then got a job as a HGV technician. I worked for various companies, mainly Volvo trucks, a bit of work at Mercedes Benz. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, late 20s happened and we're walking around. I worked in quite a large workshop. So during the week, you'd have like 12, 15 techs in, but weekends doing 12 hour days, going four on, four off shifts. Gives you a lot of time to think when there's only four people in there floating around. <laughs> yeah. Do I really want to be doing this all the time? Like yeah, 10 years <laughs> in the future. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Walking around. Like, I remember working, I had an apprentice work with me and I could tell him in encyclopedic detail what the engine did. And so I started having a look at other jobs. And I remember I grew up in a place called Basingstoke, but Reading has got a, um, I think it's BP or Shell have got a fuel testing facility there. And basically, yeah. they run engines so they blow up and then drain, drain the oil out and check the engine. I'm like, well, I can do that. I can strip engines. I can definitely run engines so they blow them up uh, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Was that your excitement part? With this? You just heard the blowing up part and you thought, I mean. Yeah, if, if it's loud, noisy and got tires on it, I'm normally well into it. <laughs> that's your remit. That's, that's the, the, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. A lifelong mud cyclist, uh, lifelong watching motor racing. I currently design high performance cars and I've designed motorcycles before in the past. But yeah, so I remember reading that job spec thinking, awesome, this looks like me. I can do all the analysis and then, you know, engineering degree, engineering degree. Every job I read, like I have worked this job at Triumph Motorcycles designing their bikes, but I remember reading their job spec being, must have an engineering degree. So <laughs> I ended up at 26 or 27, going to university for four years and come out the other side with a master's in engineering wow which, congratulations well, for that thank yeah, thank you very much but it that what really surprised me on the subject in neurodiversity there was a lot of self-limiting beliefs i'd had uh in my early life of what i couldn't couldn't do and it's like you know uni education is for clever people who can spell put the right there in a sentence and all that okay. kind of stuff yeah i guess with university in sense i mean it does have i mean it, it's kind of like the creme de la creme of education that's how i see it, you know in yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the sense that and I, and I guess if you're neurodiverse in some aspects then there are this 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 thought pattern that goes through my thinking do i belong here you know can i get the 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 great when you look at the application process and you think well actually you know you need to get this 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 and this to to apply um and then when you, you know if you can get through the door and you can get there then a lot of it, like I said, that that mindset around yeah. you know, it being a university, I, I, I can definitely see Yeah, it. and you, you end up like making loads of friends, obviously, at university and having neurotypical friends, and we help each other coursework, and they will pick me up and <laughs> have a laugh when I've put something really random in the middle of a sentence. But I did engineering, so STEM subject, but there's various stuff where we're doing statics or dynamics, you know, calculating forces on an object or how stuff moves. Well, I visualize it, and then I slowly come to realize that maybe lots of other people couldn't do that. <laughs> so, Matt, how? Why have you used this calculation for this part? Well, because that's how it moves. Is it? Yeah, yeah. And then you'd be doing stuff with pens and rulers in a lecture, trying to show them. And I, oh, I understand now. And it's that, like, that in general. Then that's just. I mean, people would say to you, "How do you do this?" And you know, "How do you do this?" This and this. And I guess you know, like like for everything, you're thinking, "Well, that's all I know." You know, that's that's kind of. It's not like you just. I mean, we learn skills. Don't get me wrong. Um, you yes, know, but, but a lot of the stuff um, that we do is just kind of inherently. Uh, that's kind of how we problem solve. That's how we we see things. Um, yeah. And it's particularly with as you know, you mentioned in your intro of my website, Dyslexia Life Hacks. As I've been finding out stuff as I launched that and talking to other neurodiverse people and then comparing it with neurotypical people, you're like, oh, I thought everybody thought like that. <laughs> it's like, well, so, yeah. so, so that could have been a little bit of a light bulb moment in the sense of thinking, well, actually, maybe people think that. So 
Matthew, when you um, so so you were diagnosed at what age again? Sorry, just six. Six. So very, like I said, it's very kind of early on, and then, then mm. you know you've obviously you know spoken to you, you said you you know your mum about uh, you know how that kind of process works and 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 those elements. So so school. So was school? Did school feel any different to you growing up to your peers? I think so. I've got quite an eclectic set of peers. So primary, not so much. Um, I'd always be the guy in the corner with the um, the unsung heroes of school. I, I don't. They used to call them special need assistant. But I don't know what they're called now. Um, you know, back in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, I, um, education's moved on. I think it's you know learning learning support. Um, yeah, they, some yeah learning support yeah. assistants probably what they call them now. And so I'd always be sat off, particularly during English lessons, in with them in the corner. Uh, and then as I got to secondary school and my school split us up into groups with ability, then I would be in the lowest group in English and then the second highest in science. Yeah. So quite, you'd end up with And the problem with that, that I found with the lower group in English is that, that I'm in there because I'm dyslexic and my dyslexia is really bad for sort of spelling grammar side of it. Yeah. Um, that's my particular strong point with my ed, uh, weak point, sorry, with my ed site profile. Um, but you're also in there with the kids that just don't want to be there. So <laughs> it's, it, it's it's a difficult um it's a difficult balance uh, mm. you know and, and I guess you know I, I can only relate to kind of my school and I, I mentioned about primary school I look I always kind of I guess I look back on primary school with rose tinted glasses and I think <laughs> everything was fine and everything was there but with um you know diagnosed dyslexia and ADHD I'm pretty sure it wasn't just smooth uh, sailing. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess I probably only really kind of relate to the problems in school with the secondary. And I think it's something that you've, you've kind of mentioned in the sense that you start getting tested or you start getting um, kind of uh, accounted for your ability. So it's a case of, you know, this is uh, an English lesson. You need to conform. You need to do this, 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 and this. And, and then you're graded at the end of it. So I guess yeah. those elements of stress uh, and anxiety that would come into it, that's probably why I, I personally think of primary school of, you know, building blocks and having fun and, <laughs> and coloring in and all these other bits and pieces. And then secondary school being a real kind of a real struggle. Yeah, um, I think I was kind of odd. So like primary school, I do remember being because because you always go off and sit in the corner of the classroom. We had quite a big classroom. I, you'd always be the guy who's asked, why are you sat over there? Or why do you have to disappear off of this lesson? And, and, and at that age, I was like, well, you know, <laughs> don't want yeah. to tell people why. Um but, but were you I told don't... why, Matthew? Were you told why? Well, you know, yeah, why I knew because well, it, it, it was because I was dyslexic, so I needed yeah. one to one help to help me bring me on. But you know, and why are you the person who sits behind in exams as everybody leaves and you're sat there still squirreling away? Yeah, and, and it, I could. It can have a I massive never, impact, can't it? Yeah, I could never square in my head, particularly at secondary school, where he, I, I'd be in a high group for maths and science, and then a a low group for English and it'd just be all over the place and I'd end up with a quite a big mix of people because you'd suddenly appear in the high group class for yeah. maths and science and then people would disappear off to a different classroom for an English lesson. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's that's difficult. Like I said, that, that kind of trial where where you you, you yeah you, you feel kind of because secondary school you know for, for me I just kind of wanted to fit in. I just wanted to kind of just get by oh, yeah. and, and kind of, <laughs> you know, be, you know, a complete extrovert in those aspects, but just kind of, just kind of, you know, just fly underneath the radar. And I guess with, with what you're saying is that you're then with your peers in, you know, the higher set classes mm. and you know, you kind of feel that com camaraderie around that element. And then you're then separated, then you're in a different class, then you're in this. So as a, as a, you know, a young adult, that must have been, like you said, hard to deal with in your, in your mind. Yeah. I, I do remember, yeah, it was always tricky with that because, as, as I alluded to earlier, that he, a completely different attitude between the high group and the low group. When you're in English, that you know, I've been in English class and the teacher's got no control. And then we, I moved to the science class. My next lesson, we're all we're all sat there geeking out about the science experiment, and it's the difference between the different groups of kids at that age. Uh, but they're always like, well, you're the smart one. Why are you with us a lot for this lesson? And then you disappear off with all your friends in the smart group afterwards was always the sort of teasing. But I do remember in the first few years of secondary school, they didn't do that. It was more GCSE levels they did that. Um, and I would be sat with my sort of peers and the other groups who I st I'm still friends with today. Uh, I remember yeah. bringing in like 
five pages of essays and they're bringing in 15, 20. And like, how have you written so little? Well, because I'm concise. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you written so much? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we mentioned about, so, you know, we, we kind of fast forward, kind of left, left school. Then did you do, the, is it college, then university, or is it then? Uh, yes, I went to college and studied a national diploma in engineering. Um, but by the time I got to the end of college, I, I went for my last year of school to my first year at college and one student a year, which because I suddenly started doing stuff I really liked, so I just threw everything at it. Um, but by the time I'd done three years of that, I was kind of burnt done with education and a little bit of a misunderstanding of what an engineer does and what university means and I guess a misheld belief on my part that that's where all the smart people with the, uh, I don't know, the expensive families and the super high grades go, which is completely wrong. <laughs> uh, so I got a job uh, as a HTV mechanic. Uh, yeah. My dad always, me and my dad used to fix his lorries when we were younger. So it was kind of a natural thing I ended up in. And it, as a, and it was only then I did that for nearly eight years and then went to university, which was a shock when you turn up and your first lesson is dynamics followed by maths and they put like the equation on the board. Does, does anybody not know what this means? And I realised I'm the only one who's done that. What was, the, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> what was the kind of, you know, the, the kind of the, the feeling of then going back as a kind of a, um, you know, as a student kind of later on in life, so to speak? I mean, it's not, you know, and, and that kind of emotion going through thinking, you know, obviously it was a, you know, something that you wanted to kind of learn and stuff. So, so that was definitely there. But what was the kind of the emotion like going, going back? It was, yeah. It was a big step um, because I gave up job and went back full time. I knew uh, with how I learned that I'd have to throw everything at it uh, yeah. at that point of time anyway. Um, so it was a huge shock. I moved, I went to uni in Scotland. So Scottish degrees are slightly different. English degrees are over four years. And their first year is a little bit, uh, they're a little bit more like doing the second part of an AS level. So that ramped me into it pretty quickly. But it was a, was a shock <laughs> being 26 27 and suddenly 17 year olds turn up in the same lecture as you is a bit interesting but i remember my first year my first semester i went all the way through it and we have to do quite heavy mathematics and there's a book that's like three inches thick called engineering math mathematics by stroud and i they were cruel by making us do exams in january so christmas holidays revising exams <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um I remember having to start from the beginning of that and I just went through it. It was the first exam all the way through it until I got to the day before the exam. And that's as far as I revised. No past papers, just learnt it from first principles all the way through. It did all the power laws that we'd learnt in lectures to try and get my brain back into this gear. And then I got an A. So I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> that was, yeah, all Christmas holiday, just sat with this textbook, filled a notepad up, and then got decent grades for the rest of the exams that I had to sort of lower priorities to catch up. But yeah interestingly how stuff has changed as well so from school where you just sat with a teacher but still wrote stuff down by hand to university where i was doing coursework by using draglin drag draglin what's that dragon <laughs> naturally speaking <laughs> no no that, that's brilliant because i was going to ask what kind of you know stuff uh maybe you know assistive technology what kind of things did you use to kind of uh, assist with that yeah. so dragon was yeah, so Dragon was the main one, uh, and then yeah, your well, your sponsor with their text help where it reads it back out to you. Yeah, uh, yeah Claro text help was the key. The key ones I used uh, used to sit. Got really good at <laughs> really good at presentations because I'd already talked the subject into my laptop so many times <laughs> <laughs> writing report on it. So yeah, Dragon was the thing that saved me because um, I always run the analogy that there's like a six lane motorway in my head with all the information, but it has to come out on a little B road <laughs> and dragon grows the B road into an A road. Um, a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So that really helps. Although it's quite amusing having to then fix all its quirks. Have you ever used dragon at all? Yeah, I've used dragon, uh, Clara. I've used um, a, a few other kind of a, a assistive technology um, as well. Yeah. I, I, I'm quite fortunate really in the sense that I, I've kind of given quite a, a few different techs to kind of um sort of trial and, and see what it looks like um and stuff so so yeah i mean and and i guess that's uh you know brings me on to the next thing is is 
you know, for me, there's certain um, assistive technology that, uh, I mean, it, it all kind of works, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's incredible now, what we've got now, definitely to what I had when I was going in the schools and kind of the 80s, 90s. But, <laughs> yeah. but I guess, um, you know, for, for each individual, one would one would work better for someone or one would just, would you, would, have you found that, Matthew, have you found that something would, maybe it's easier to use or maybe you just connect with it or maybe, yeah. You know, I, I- I think so. Um, I think there is there is a certain usability of it, and it's yeah. Dragon was just the one that I got given. It was installed on the you get the laptop uh, through the government scheme to assist people with neurodiversity uh, at university. So it's the one it come with, and it it does work really well. And uh, but I have sharing notes. Being an engineer is quite popular for people who are neurodiverse. So swapping notes with other dyslexic people, it's interesting how some of them don't like it. Uh, particularly, I went to uni in Scotland. They have gone sc- strong Scottish accents. So <laughs> sometimes it, Siri never used to understand what they were saying. Where I use, um, I will dictate stuff to my phone via Siri and things like that. So, yeah, I have found that I used to find some stuff just seemed clunky. And as it was a point we were making the other day, where uh, Dragon's brilliant if you're at home in your home office, but you can't yell it across <laughs> an open plan office at work, can you? <laughs> Do you do you do you find then um, you know you, how did um, dyslexia hacks? I mean, I know you briefly mentioned the fact that you kind of you thought to yourself, you know, I, I thought everyone kind of knew this, and and I guess de- definitely with me with my kind of journey of understanding dyslexia and ADHD and now kind of more neurodiversity, I do think you know people are kind of asking me questions, thinking, well, is that not you know, did, did people not know that? So how did that kind of dyslexia hacks come about? Is it, oh, is so- it by the way? Oh, thank you very much. So, yeah, Dyslexia Life Hacks is a website I did uh, last year. Really, it come back a few years ago. So, as I say, being in STEM environment, we're all swapping notes all the time. And I remember sitting with a project manager I was working at the time, and we're doing a project plan, and we're both dyslexic and can't spell this word. And I, without thinking, I've got my phone on the desk, um, call the assistant up. Uh, I won't say its name. I was every phone going mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you go? <laughs> yeah. How do you spell whatever the word was and of course it speaks yeah. it back to you and he just looked at me he's like i never realized you could do that and it kind of started a light bulb off in my head um and as we went through like i never knew that word had a synonym checker in it so you know if you put the wrong word in a sentence you right click synonyms and you look at all the synonyms you're like well they're not what i'm after <laughs> it's like another yeah. way of checking i said like, why is there not a place where i can find this and i was like dyslexia hacks or just whatever into google and Lifehacker do one, and I think a couple of other websites do it at uh, times or whatever. But they're all big swathes of text. I'm like, well, this is clearly not written by a dyslexic person, is it? Like, here, read lots of stuff. Um, yeah. So I unfortunately got made redundant last year. So it's one of the things I did while I was redundant. I thought, I'm going to make a website. Talk- <laughs> Typical dyslexic thing. I'm going to teach myself how to make a website, how to use Photoshop, I'm how so- to put this together. <laughs> I, think at lockdown, I think I've built seven websites. <laughs> You know, some websites I, I don't even know what I'm going to do with them. I'm just kind of like, ah, just yeah, do I could do that surely. Uh, <laughs> how hard could it be? Um, <laughs> and I realised I had 21 of them already on a notepad saved in my phone. So that's it. Yeah, um, I didn't realise people didn't know that there's dyslexic friendly fonts. I didn't know there was people out there who've got like dyslexia correction programs and various other methods, like using mind maps or there's like the David Davis method. So I like yeah, the idea that big. yeah. Yeah, so I had to go. I tried that in January, and that's amazing. But I like yeah. the idea that school taught us that we're PCs, but actually we're Macs. So once you've taught how to use a Mac rather than trying to use a PC badly, a Mac <laughs> badly as a PC, things work. <laughs> so that's really impressive. Um, yeah, there's loads on it. And I've had lo- a few people sort of drop me messages like they didn't know. One of my favorite ones is the uh, Hey uh, Google It hack, which is. You know, if you've got a word that you can't spell, so say the example of the website yeah, yeah. rises. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Speaking to the choir, yeah. <laughs> um, so the word is rises. So you've tried multiple times to try and get the word rises in word, and it just gives you the red squiggly or autocorrects it to the wrong thing. And you're like, well, the red squiggly line's gone, but that's the wrong word. Yeah. Well, there's a Batman movie called Dark Knight Rises. So if you write Dark Knight, then the word ro- your misspelling arises in Google, hit go, and you get a picture of a movie poster come up, and Google will, do you mean this? You've now got the spelling for Rises. 
And it's also a cool excuse to Google Batman. <laughs> <laughs> you just call him Batman, aren't you? You just you just want to be you just yeah, wanna, yeah just yeah. You'll be putting yeah. sign up next. <laughs> yeah, I need to do return so I can Google Superman. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what? The, 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 I, I want to kind of just briefly go go back to um, you mentioned about dyslexic friendly fonts. Now, yes. about six it must be well, it must be about like six years ago when I was kind of just kind of six seven years ago, kind of just really kind of using linkedin i mean linkedin's mm. changed massively now um yes, yes, yes. Uh, um and i i find it incredibly useful to you know to connect and get the message out and, and it's just phenomenal for me um and you know a lot of the connections that, I, that i've got but i always remember it probably about six seven years ago i um might have been a little bit later i put a, a leaflet up that um i had made when i first started my very first company sort of 10 11 12 years ago and i put this leaflet up and it was almost there's a as you know we do neurodiversity stories, a massive lover of storytelling. So I was kind of t telling the story of this leaflet of how my first day of leaving a job and going around and um, posting this leaflet out. And and then um, a gentleman came out and, and ripped the leaflet up and threw it in a puddle. And, um, and oh, you know, nice and then nice. I took the leaflet and I put it, uh, I dried it off and I sat it together and put it in a frame. Okay. That's kind of the, <laughs> the brief um, thing. So yeah. it's almost like, and then you've built this company and that was your first day. But I didn't realize I put this uh, this leaflet up and just showed people and put the story, like the emotional story behind it, um, which I won't go into, you know, that's the, the premise of the story. I couldn't believe how many comments and how angry people got over Comic Sans. I, it, was just, <laughs> it was um I think I wanted back then, I think I had one of the highest reaches for post, like six seven and a half thousand people looking at hundreds of comments and there was like heated debates going on about oh, comic sans i was just I like comic sans <laughs> <laughs> i do <laughs> but, but honestly, apparently it, it's quite dyslexic friendly from what i understand exactly and and for me i mean if anyone is watching this and uh i mean please don't get into a debate about comic sans <laughs> <laughs> um but but yeah comment how much you like it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll just throw it out do we do we love comic sans um <laughs> what have, what have we done uh yeah, so, so I just, fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just couldn't believe it. it was um some of the you know people were so passionate about it and i was thinking <sighs> i've used comic sans for like forever i I love it, you know, and yeah, it, it's something about it. It's it's supposed to be dyslexic friendly, and I used to proofread presentation stuff in Comic Sans, <laughs> which is can catch you out if you forget to swap it back to Times New Roman before you put it in front of anybody. Uh, or you send it. I always um, another hack: use your friends. Uh, send it across to one of my colleagues and go, "Can you proofread this?" It's like, yeah, but why is it Comic Sans? Because Comic Sans is great. Uh. <laughs> You know, they just, I, I don't know. I mean, it was, I, I guess I, I didn't really, I wasn't in the world to, you know, marketing and advertising. And I didn't realize how, you know, a lot of people's obviously had a lot of bad problems with Comic Sans before. But uh, I just thought it was a, you know, it was a, a fun font. And, and yeah, yeah. you know, this, yeah. Um, uh... Courtney Castle, she says, Arrow all the way. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> I use Vedana for all my uni reports because it was quite nicely spaced. Uh. <laughs> you know, do you know, I, I love this how we basically <laughs> moved away and we, we're basically talking about fonts now. I mean, this is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> where, where the conversation leads. So, dyslexia. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this is something. This is something that you still you're still actively um, sourcing, still finding, and supporting. Yes, yeah. So the, the website's a free resource, and it's just something I run in my spare time. Um, there is a submit a hacker op option on there if anybody's got other ideas. But yeah, I'm sort of always trying to keep my um, ear to the ground of various stuff. I, it's grown into other things where I found myself connecting with people like yourself and the, the wider neurodiversity community and amazed at how many people are out there with great ideas or just great stories or how positive everybody is. Because I've learned over the years, it took me embarrassingly over 30 to realize that actually being neurodiversity is a bit of a gift and actually brings advantages in places where other people who are neurotypical may not have a strong point. So it's, you know, the world balances itself out. That's why I don't think it's um, really sort of a disability. It's just a different way of looking at the world, like the Mac versus the PC kind of thing. Yeah. And then you get, you get taught as a PC, but you're a Mac and then it all ends up being a tie in yourself in your head. And the emotional attachment yeah. hangs itself on them. And that's really tough. And it's one of the things I lost at uni was, hang on, I'm doing this. And wow. <laughs> so you start it's, shedding off all the limiting beliefs. 
Absolutely. And I, and I guess we, you know, whenever we, we, we tend to kind of discuss neurodiversity, you know, I've that, you know, discussed dyslexia and ADHD, we tend mm. to always kind of, there's kind of a journey that, that, you know, that unfolds. And I, and I guess, you know, we, we tend to focus, um, not all the time, but generally focus, maybe the media would focus or something else that, uh, on things that we can't do, or maybe yes. Yes. the you know the negative that element uh, uh, of that and i guess you know having more conversations like this and sharing more stories and more success stories and and how people kind of relate to things then it kind of starts breaking down but i i guess initially we always got this you know what well, you know i struggle with this i struggle with this and so the message that we're putting out a lot of the time does you know gravitate yeah. to that but um yeah and I think so. Even some of the new hacks, like one somebody submitted one, just be bold, be different, think differently. Was and I thought it was great. It's not actually a hack per se, but it's a great bit of mindset. Um, so that that's sort of the last one that got launched. And uh, yeah, just there are little things to help you out. Like if your particular thing is dyslexic fonts, because that helps you read. Like Amazon Kindle let you download them to it, or uh, you can even plug them into Word now. I and you, I was half tempted to write the whole website in it, but uh, <laughs> I didn't in the end. Um, <laughs> So that's quite useful. I do silly things like I've always used. I always use the same pen just to help my handwriting. So I've got loads of pens everywhere, and I just think it's gives me one point to come back to the same thing all the time. Um, I, yeah. You know. <laughs> no, I agree. I, 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 there, there is a certain pen, a certain type of pen that I like to write with. Um, yeah. I, I even find I don't know if it's dyslexia. Next week's sponsor, it's right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but generally, if if the pen if if the, if the pen's too kind of doesn't feel right it's not smooth enough i i move on i mean that that's probably just i don't know if that's fussiness or um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we're just mad yeah <laughs> how do you matthew how do you um i know we we touched on um before we we you know we uh, kind of come on air we were talking about um you know learning um you know uh, music and things like this how yeah. how generally do you find yourself um you know learning new things so I'll, I'll give you an example so you mentioned the mac for instance okay yes. so i've yeah. uh, you know an android and iphone you didn't mention that i did right yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay. you mentioned so, so me transferring over to something sometimes there is a big battle as in you know i love something new i love learning stuff and creative but when i check try to change from a pc to a mac i mm -hmm. literally have i go to a coffee shop you know pre-covid but well, you can do it now um but and i would literally take both computers and I do some work <laughs> on uh, this. Is, uh, I know I do some <laughs> some work on the, the PC, and then do other work. So I'm, I'm sat there, you know, at a coffee table doing this, and it took me such a long time to transfer over and just go. Actually, I'm just going to use the Mac, and now I wouldn't, you know, it, I use it for absolutely everything. But it's that transition. It's again, when I was Android and iPhone, how, is that? Is it? How do, How do you deal with learning new things or convert from the old to the new? Uh, I quite enjoy it. I mean, I must admit, I've had the same mobile phone make uh, for years, but I recently started the new job, uh, which you alluded to in the intro, and that uses a different CAD package, so a computer-aided design package. So I've used the same one for three years, and then I have to learn a new one. But I quite enjoy that. I, I don't know whether it's just something in my brain or it's a mode I get into, because having to teach myself how to build websites and things only two months before, I'd already got into this. So what I end up doing is squirreling around for a good guide on how to do it. Believe it or not, it's LinkedIn learning seems on LinkedIn. And that got me up to speed. Yeah. Um, so I'm not too attached to sort of the old ways because I've spent most of my life trying to work out a way of doing things because the current way doesn't work for me. So as we alluded to in school, you end up having to, I think grit comes up quite a lot in the dyslexic world because you end up having to slog your way through things and learn yeah. alternative ways. It was always what frustrated me with spelling. It's like, I'm able to learn quite a lot pretty quickly, apart from how to do this bit, which yeah. is really kind of strange. So I don't, yeah, I, I said, well, you must look like the richest guy in a coffee shop with your two laptops. <laughs> I, I <don't> know. <laughs> you, you, you say that, but you should see my old PC. Uh, <laughs> beat to death, is it? I think right? it was like yeah. an old PC computer or something, you know, with the bright orange uh, keyboard. And <laughs> well, yeah, it'd be interesting. I've not used a Mac. Uh, but I think something like that where it's ingrained, like been using Windows for, it feels like forever, yeah. doesn't it? Um, that might be a shocker. If I, but even like driving left-hand drive cars and lorries never sort of bothered me. I, I quite like the... I think, I, think, I think it's, do you know what it is? I think, you know, I think it's a case of if if I can 
you know, set myself to learn something. So if I've got time to kind of, and there's no pressure on uh, yes. learning it in a certain amount of time or something. So, but because I kind of with, you know, the PCs, for instance, or the Macs or whatever, I associate with that actually as a tool to, uh, you know, to do emails or to, to, you know, create things like this or anything else like this, there is that certain pressure. And then it's the, the, the kind of the learning that, and then getting that done. I think, um, yeah, the pressure bit is hard, isn't it? Um, because I'm like, yes, I, I I got this new thing I can learn, and I get really geeking into it. And it's like, but if it's at work, it's like, but I need to, to deliver to the deadline. And do you ever find, I find like the initial learning phase is great. Like I've learned this new thing, and I'm from zero to 50, 100. And then it drops off as like the, the voices creep in a little bit. Am I actually any good at this? <laughs> all the time, all the time. Yeah. I, I critique things all the time. I mean, I'm a, uh, I am tend to learn uh, visually. Uh, you yes, know, so same here. A lot of my uh, learnings are, uh, you know, YouTube-based. So I will literally, yeah. Yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I will go to YouTube and I think, okay, I, I want to learn how to do, um, you know, how to uh, critique a, a LinkedIn Live. So I would you know, look at YouTube, look how someone else has done it, and then start learning. Or if it's um, soft software or an animation or video or anything else, I will just kind of watch snippets of this. Then I'll start, you know, take that, I'll learn this, take that, learn this. And then suddenly, you know, the skill base grows. If it was a, a book element, you know, I was reading that and then doing this, that, that yeah. would, I, I guess I'd struggle. I'm, well, yeah, uh, I'm not too sure. I, I think it's uh, dyslexia being the gift of mastery. If you can find a way that you're able to learn it, which you and I do the same thing, we both dive on YouTube, we can actually learn things as dyslexic people faster. But if we're throwing the textbook, then that's a little bit harder with having to process the written information. As you say, like sitting there with YouTube tutorials, great, just follow along. <laughs> I've got this. And then I, our, yeah. our dyslexic brain soaks it all in and goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I put it on. I put, I sort of put out my eleven computers all around me, and I'm. Get <laughs> <laughs> it? So I, I do. I mean, I literally just have my iPad, um, or you know, or some another screen, looking at it, or on my phone, and then I'm kind of almost, you know, stopping, pausing, trying, stopping, pausing, trying, you know, yeah. uh, and and you know, on on that, that aspect. So that's how I kind of. But do you find with... that you've then got it? Yeah. It, it, once it's once it's once it's there, it's in. Um, it's in. And... But then you start thinking to yourself, well, actually, could it be better? Yes, you know, and, yes, and yes, yes, the voices. <laughs> have, have you um, compared that to a neurotypical person, how they learn? First, have you ever sort of done, the, after you and, I don't know, a friend of yours tried to learn the same thing off YouTube and compared whether you're ahead of them or behind them in terms no, of I, doing it that way? No, I haven't. It's something I'd be that. curious to do, uh, just sort of try a new skill and see, uh, you know, t something that talent is not a going to be a thing. Uh, but it's... Yeah, from what I understand, how dyslexics think, if you're doing a visual kind of task, like learning things off YouTube, which is what everybody does now, you're actually in an advantage. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, I don't know where I'd be without YouTube. It's, it's, it's <laughs> I, mean, I literally just, you know, I, I think it's just it's just a marvel, really, because I can kind of, you know, whatever it is I want to learn, there's something there that someone's even done it. Even if it's, you know, um, I don't know, unblocking a sink or something. I know I do that. <laughs> just, to clarify, right. <laughs> just to clarify, just to clarify, YouTube, how to unblock a sink. Um, but, but you know what I mean? That there are so many things that you can, um, you know, you, you can search for. And for me, being a visual learner, brilliant. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Huge advantage being a visual learner when everybody's learning via video. <laughs> so, so Matthew, you, you if you could just tell us, because it sounds really quite, uh, really exciting what you do is a, is, is a day job, very technical. Hmm. Um, yes. I, I bet it's kind of very, very challenging at times. Yes. And, yes. And, it, and it's great. It's a passion of yours as well. Yes. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm a senior vehicle design engineer um, for a company called RML Group, and they specialize in uh, high performance engineering. They're a bit of the unsung heroes of motorsport. So, if you go watch British touring cars at the weekend, most of the cars have RML parts on them. Um, but what I what a design engineer is, is if you've ever seen the CAD programs where they've got a car or a bike or whatever on screen and it's all done in 3D, yeah. I do that. Uh, so you will have a car or a motorcycle. When I used to work for Triumph, you start with a blank sheet of paper, some styling sketches or, or in a project I'm doing at the moment, it's a bit of reverse engineering. You will then work it out produce the parts in three three dimensions then you've got to do all the analysis to stress stuff to make sure it doesn't break the sun doesn't destroy it all that kind of stuff whatever 
it needs to go in production calculations for how tight to do all the bolts up, what bolts to use, all that for stuff, and then walk it through to testing, uh, you know, and refining prototypes into more uh, solid production models. And then the vehicle comes out, and then, you know, look what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a process, though, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's fascinating. And uh, the companies I've tended to work for like their engineers to be quite dynamic. So you end up having quite a lot of, I guess, new stimulus to deal to learn with, um, which suits me because I like that. Um, so, so at Triumph, they turn around bikes in about three years. So they spend three years on one project, and I was doing brakes and stuff on one bike, and then the next bike I might do something completely different, um, and that's good fun. <laughs> Three years. That's that, that's. An, I mean, you know, it, it's it's obviously you know the quality that they're, they're putting out is immense. But like I said, three years. I, I guess in this day and age where we're kind of a we want it now culture, um, yeah. that's 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 that's, that's, that's three years from somebody in the front of the co company saying we want a new bike. It should be X, and then it's in three years' time it rolls off and you can go buy it. So that's all of the styling work, the background engineering. Then your, you, you know, two wheel vehicles are sort of a bit unstable, really, and you have to kind of uh, test them to make sure you don't hurt anybody. <laughs> then they go into production. When you said that, I think to myself, three years is a long time. But when you've just said, you know, from a, an idea and design as a, you know, as an, uh, you know, an engineer, you probably think that's not long enough. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a flat out hustle. <laughs> like, uh, from day one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a good mug somewhere that engineer, an engineer is an organism that, that thrives on ridiculous deadlines and lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the latter as well. Yeah, yeah. Coffee's great. Uh, <laughs> but, but it is a, uh, there's quite a lot to do because the, the sheer detail of it, you're having to deal with multiple components coming in places and you've got to have, they've got to be close enough to one another that it, there's no gaps and all that kind of stuff, but you've got tolerances. So each part can be within a size band and they've got to make sure that if you get two that are at the biggest, they don't touch. Then you're doing your stress counts to make sure it doesn't break in certain low cases. Like for if it has an accident, it's got to survive it. You also got to think about when it's parked outside in the rain and all this kind of thing. You've got to make sure the bike's stable when it's ridden at 120 mile hour down the back straight Donton Park or whatever. There's a lot that goes into these things. Wow. And a team of like 30 people are, are split off into all these little details. So lots of collaboration. Yeah. Um, and it's the same at the job at RML where we're working really hard to sort of meet deadlines. How do you find that from a seven neurodiverse background in in maybe in, in the planning meetings and these? Is it something that you 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 go in feeling, you know, you, you thrive in. Uh, is there certain parts of it that you find, you know, so a it, more struggle? Uh, it tends to be a hotbed for neurodiverse people anyway, so I'm not normally the only neurodiverse person in the yes. room. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it really depends. If I'm minute taker, that's a little bit of a struggle because my hand and hearing <laughs> can't work at the same time sometimes. But if we're doing quite a lot of it's design reviews, so you might sit in a meeting with the design up on the screen and my neurodiverse brain if it's looking at a powerpoint slide is already lifted whatever the part is off of it so quite a few times it's the neurodiverse people who pipe up like why are we doing it this way let me try this and then you can see everybody else's brain going oh, oh that might be a good idea uh, or not sometimes but, <laughs> yeah. but um uh, you know i come up with the sometimes the crazy stuff uh because why not push the edges and then push them Tie them, tie them back in once you come to something sort of homogenous for production. I don't find it too bad. It's only when a minute taking uh, it can be a struggle. Yeah. But I've say sort of doing various methods recently. I've got I've got better at that. But otherwise, in meetings, it doesn't make me too anxious at all um, because I do what I I really love engineering. It's a passion of mine, sort of vehicles and anything motor related. Yeah. Well, it's never as I want to be working, so I <laughs> get to carry on. So you, you, you know, that that's incredible. So you definitely don't. I mean, the the journey, like you said, you, you know, then kind of leaving, uh, you know, a, a, a full time position, stable job, mm. and then going back to, you know, going into university and getting that, and then leaving that is, is you know, it's real credit to yourself. Oh, thank and you. In, in in the sense of you know, and now you're doing something that you really love and you enjoy, and mm. the, and I always find. You know, and, and probably, you know, what we touched on just now and we said about how we kind of find something, you know, if, if we look the different way that we learn and how much work we put into things. And I guess, you know, because you're doing something that you're really passionate about and you love, the amount of, 
kind of work that you would put in and effort and everything would be would be tenfold because you you know it's a real passion of yours yeah yeah and it's yeah i i can't sometimes get it straight in my head that i used to span a lorries in a pair of overalls for, for years and years and years and now i i'm sort of sat there designing the whole thing the 20 the early 20 year old me would have never believed that's what i'd have done by my mid 30s um and that, even that's an advantage if anybody's out there who's a mechanic now but feels like they want to be a designer having a mechanics background is really handy because you already know how stuff bolts together and whether you can get your hand into spaces to undo it again and all that kind of stuff which yeah we, how, how, what's your views just lastly what's your views on electric cars <laughs> um just just lastly just throw that out there but that's a question um, I think it's it's definitely the way it's going to be going, and I think intercity yeah, it's going to be the thing we do. I think. Um, yeah. I they've quite like. Away, they? They're incredible. They have, and they are getting better. And it's impressive technology. The the techie side of me really enjoys it. Um, but I do quite like the theatre of shifting gears and pulling clutches and and the noise yeah. and stuff. So I'd be disappointed if an electric Ferrari went past me, but because <laughs> you need that V twelve <laughs> noise and theatre. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I completely get that. I mean, I always find you know with electric cars just how quiet they are. They tend yeah, to sweep yeah. up, you know, uh, next to you. But it's yeah, it's an interesting debate of how do you warn pedestrians who are tuned into listening to internal combustion cars making noise? Because uh, you walk, you know, it's like you, you stood there, get about across the road, you can hear the car coming. If it's a Tesla, <laughs> you can't <Yeah. laughs> until it's a lot closer. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing. I think I heard a story and they were saying they were spending, you know, so many millions on trying to get a design to put onto these vehicles to sound like a car. Um, <laughs> and, and again, I'm, I'm not, don't quote me on this, but I, I did read something. They, you know, they spent so much money on this, um, you know, and it was just to try and make the car sound like a car, uh, the electric car sound like a normal car, but then they, yeah. whether they shelf that or not, I don't know. Um, uh, well, I'd be surprised because you'd, you'd want to cut the noise pollution down. So <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that uh, that yeah. area. <laughs> yeah, leave it, to, leave it to, um, yeah. to you guys to, <laughs> to, to mold over it. Maybe that's one of your next next projects. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Matthew. It's been absolutely incredible uh, speaking oh, to you. I can speak you. to you uh, all day, my friend. Um, it's been it's just been uh, uh, informative, really good fun. Um, Matthew, if, if people want to. Um, get in touch with you or uh see the you know dyslexia uh, life hacks then how how can people get hold of you so they can find me on linkedin i think you've linked me into this anyway or they can go on dyslexialifehacks.com and there's a contact form there and if you feel like submitting a hack great or just drop me a message on it i'll pick it up uh, at the other end that's amazing matthew thank you so much uh for, for your time um no and um like i said really really do appreciate you sharing sharing your wisdom uh and thank I you have a, an amazing rest of uh, Friday and uh, an amazing weekend. And I will catch up with you very, very soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. You're most welcome. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. So, guys, that was Matthew. I hope you uh, enjoyed that just as much as I did on uh, on here. Absolutely incredible chap, doing phenomenal work for neurodiversity. Um, and and his his day job and his work. I mean, I don't think he, he gave it justice the amount of kind of technical elements that he's he's dealing with on a daily basis. But guys, I want to say a massive thank you as well to all the people that have watched this live, all the people that have uh, watched it on replay. Your support on neurodiversity. Neurodiversity stories has been uh, immense, and I really do uh, appreciate it. If you are uh, looking to share your story or come in to ha have a chat with me uh, on a Friday, then please do get in touch. Um, comment below or um, or get in touch with me through the social channels. Guys, have an amazing rest of the Friday. Have a fantastic weekend, and I will see you soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye.